Alrighty, good evening. Great games at your table. I am Game Master J, also known as Jonathan Albin, and we are bringing just a relatively short show tonight. I have a couple of topics I want to cover, and uh, this is my general time of broadcast, so I'm glad to be here and share this with you. We've got uh, a couple of topics we want to cover, and then uh, we'll be uh, closing out. Of course, if anybody jumps on and has a point they want to bring up, feel free to drop that into the chat, and I'm willing to uh, continue the show as long as there's somebody on the air with me, um, and we will get started. So here we go. Okay, as a storyteller and game master, I often get asked with all of the years that I've seen... Uh, as a storyteller and game master, nearly 50 years, there have been changes, not only within the gameplay environment, but also in the very processes by which a game master tells his stories. And this process, this evolution, does tend to pull a game master through a variety of different uh, styles and types. And so we're gonna talk about generally an overall list of them. And if you're a game master, I'd ask you to take a look at them and consider them and, and kind of try to see where you are in the list. And when you do so, please feel free to respond in the chat and let me know some of that. And I'll be glad to have a conversation with you about what the, your current position might be and what you might want to uh, or expect to see in the future. So I'm going to be talking about the general types of game masters as time progresses. And if you are a game master, perhaps you are experiencing one or more of these and you can perhaps respond to them. So the first I'm going to list is discovery. And discovery can actually happen at very different, different points in your advancement as a storyteller or game master. Obviously the very first one will be the discovery of role play in general and what you might be able to accomplish in your storytelling during that period. Uh, a game master who is in discovery is likely to be as novice as his players concerning how the rules work. And because of this tenuous equity level, many times a discovery game master or a game master who's discovering the game will be looking to the players for their affirmation and their interpretation of particular rules. You would see, at least at first, that such a place might be uh, rather dangerous for a game master because of the you know the primary unspoken rule in every well it's, it's not unspoken it's usually written in every role play game out there that the game master is always right and your and the, his he should have the the final say on things so a game master in discovery in that position may be actually facing uh, some challenges that will harden him as a storyteller and and make that initial official rule kind of stand out. But one of the primary reasons why having a a period of discovery is good is that game masters are most malleable and most adaptable to what their players are recommending in this sort of phase of their gameplay. The level of activity that a game master has with players will be Fundamentally, how long the players can tolerate him being in this stage of discovery, because often in this stage, he's going to have his nose in the rule book. He's going to be flipping from location to location in the books, trying to work out what should happen or could have happened in that locale. And it's, it's literally just a step of being a storyteller to finally get to the point where you have acknowledged what's going on in the game and that you are competent enough, enough to make decisions on your own. So discovery may not last long, but it generally happens at the beginning of an arc and also when a new game master is eliciting a, either a new game mechanic or embracing changes that have happened in the metagame universe, if you will, of the pro property he is running. The next step of game mastering, and although the, I'm listing them as steps, they don't necessarily have to fall in this order. There may indeed be reasons for the players to... Um, am I looking in the right direction? Yeah, okay, I just want to make sure. <laughs> I've got three cameras, so 
uh, this also lends itself to the thought process that let's see that is, that's it I'm looking at the wrong camera again that's two days in a row I've done that yikes I'm sorry about that please forgive me for not paying attention to where I was looking but the experimentation phase is where the game master is uh, not only learning the rules but pushing the boundaries trying to see what kind of limits the game will uh, take into account and as many times the game master is coming to the rule set with an idea for the flavor and not really for the mechanic of the game it's a useful place for the storyteller to take some risks and put out some uh, fires for the players to uh, extinguish and such like so that his understanding of the game will become more solidified experimentation can also occur when a game master has already become familiar with the game but wants to add new flavors or new concepts that haven't been experimented with and so he wants to test them out in both of these cases in discovery and experimentation generally the rules are something that are followed that are tracked and 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 kept as a forefront mechanism it's only in later game evolutions that the game master will step away from traditional things like experience points and such um, the gauge for determining player advancement does become kind of important and then the game master will eventually get to the point where he starts to understand player rewards and this will lead inevitably to at least some period of a Monty Paul or Santa syndrome period. And uh, this is now an antique term, and it probably is not understood fully any longer, so I'll need to explain a bit more. You, most of you may not be aware, but there was at a time a, a television program like the one that's on the air today called... Uh, uh, Gosh, what was it called? Let's Make a Deal. And uh, very similar to the Let's Make a Deal that was run by Wayne Brady in the recent years, Monty Hall literally was his name, H-A-L-L. -L. Monty Hall was the uh, host of that show. And in the Monty Hall show, he would offer ridiculously valuable prices in trade for seemingly useless trinkets and... Of course, there's always a chance of getting a, a zap or a negative out of the prize trades, but it was literally like almost like a farce on the stock market that uh, you give me this and I'll give you that. And uh, what's behind the what's behind the door? What's behind the window? What's behind the box? And these the adventurers start to feel like they're in a Monty Hall adventure because when they fight a monster, suddenly there's like a uh, the chinging of a casino uh, machine and suddenly loot starts to pile out and pile up. And this process of these Monty Halls, these large payouts for the players for seemingly insignificant amount of adventuring became kind of a hallmark and a Monty Hall adventure therefore was something where there wasn't much work for the players to have gone through not much danger but they were getting highly valued items and such that in the, in addition to it advancing and promoting their persona's development they were also giving them loads of cash and making generally the life of a character life of an adventurer easier and this is also considered to be sort of like the Santa syndrome, that if you're a good little boy, then Santa will lavish you with lots of gifts and prizes. And so therefore, whether you are uh, adventuring diligently and facing risks or not, you're getting a big treasure paydays. Now, part of this is because the, the game master is in the, who has been in the experimentation phase starts to see the danger that's inherent to the player characters during the games and can therefore endanger their lives at the moment's notice and so by providing the players with the equipment the armor the weapons and such to make the fights seem more equitable the game master can be more experimentative in his use of the monsters 
by even at lower levels, providing the players the means to survive. Well, this push me, pull you effect leads to a large amount of loot being handed out and eventually players no longer see the threat and either muscle their way through the games and, and, and leave the game master confused because he can't figure out why he's not holding his own in the encounters because he's not understanding the power shift. Or, on the other hand, he's, you're, you're causing the game master to have to literally go back to the drawing board. Not only is he now past the discovery stage and experimentation stage, now he's actually trying to figure out how in the rules, by the rules, he can regain control of the game in equations. And this leads into a cycle. The game master becomes more of a deep diver. The rules become more difficult. The players become more rules lawyer-ish because they've got the gear and therefore they just want the benefit that they had before. And it push, push me, pull you until the sessions become fundamentally that of warlords, player characters that are unassailable and game masters that are intractable. And this, this leads to a problematic place in being a game master that you almost feel like you're having to do a lot of work just to play the game that you love because the players are making it so difficult. And when this occurrence happens, you're kind of stuck in a detente. Now, there are other ways to go, and we're going to talk about those in a minute. But generally speaking, a, a real good game master, a really intent game master, will now shift into what I call the BPC or the Builder, Planner, Creator stage. And that's where okay, I'm not going to be able to undo the rules as they exist. I can't take away the loot that I've legitimately given the players. That feels like bad form and will lead to negative feelings. So let's start to build new. Let's build things that are outside of the rules that will give me the, the advantage. And let's start to plan on how to promote or utilize these pieces of equipment. Now, as the builder, planner, creator goes through his process. This is actually not just an individual item type of creation, but this is in indeed the concept where the game master begins to step away from the environment and put the players in conditions that allow for the rules to quote, become under his favor again. And this is a good place to be. A builder, planner, creator is actually generating ge uh, genuine in-game excitement because the players are discovering that which was created by the game master which causes them to have to be more creative in their approach and that creates a nice little echo chamber and so generally this is where most plant most game masters get to the idea that they're going to be a builder they're going to be a planner they're going to be a creator but then they start to falter because they don't know what to do with that power and we'll, we'll We'll come back to that in a moment, but the idea is that this is the general process from discovery, experimentation, to giveaways, to take backs, to build, create, plan, next stage up, go through the process again. Now, I do want to talk about there is a point that can occur, can occur and that is when the builder, planner, creator can't operate fast enough or can't uh, express to the players clearly enough why they should stay within the rules, why they should f fall into his plot or his plan. And that is he becomes a party killer. Now, he can. this is the strongest side of this, but he could also end up merely being a train conductor. And when I say that, I'm referring to, of course, the concept of a, a railroad adventure. I, I couldn't tell you when it was. I would have to do some research. But the point in history where in the description of a game master as a train conductor or the driver of a railroad really stemmed from the production of the play uh, your way adventure stories where you as a player could pick up a book and guide yourself through a story. Once a player is aware that such a thing exists, then the very idea and necess necessity of a game master calls him, is, is called under question. Because if I can find my own way through a story, like in the play by play by decision uh, storybooks, then what's the purpose of a storyteller 
other than to guide the train. And when you play a, an adventure that is absolutely linear, linear in, its, in its construction, first you do this, then you do this, then you do this, then you do this. When you are in that kind of a railway environment where everything is step locked and you can't adventure and you can't create new pathways or you're limited, this leads to the, the failure of player, late, player agency. And that is why it's eventually called a train conductor. But the, the other end of that extent, of course, is where the players force the game master to adhere to the rules to the point where he becomes fundamentally a party killer. Everything he knows about the game has taught him how to undermine and take down the players by the mechanisms they've learned because he's just simply studied longer, become the rules lawyer, and finds himself in a situation where games groups come to his house to play a game and uh, their characters are eliminated and they have to start all over with him at a short amount of time. And this is not a, a fun place to be, and game masters generally, once they hit this wall the first time, they are able to step back and adapt. But the very idea of following your storyline to the conclusion of killing your killing your adventurers is not conducive to ongoing gameplay and you actually put yourself at risk of losing players and not having player desires to come and be in your sessions. So this is a dangerous place to go. Uh, the opposite, the, tra uh, the, the, uh, the safer end of that, the train conductor also isn't very well appreciated if the players discover that you are fundamentally running railroads, then they balk at you on every step and make the sessions more difficult to continue. Now, the second alternative way they could handle it once they get to this point, once they understand that they can take the, part, the group apart and they could put it back together, the uh, narrator can now uh, emerge. And a narrator game master is simply a sandbox monitor. He built a world, he's built concepts for the players to follow, and then he gets out of the way, mainly because he doesn't want to lead to party death and he doesn't want to be seen as a railroad conductor. Now, the challenge to a sandbox monitor is that the players have to be really strong in terms of what they want. So it lends itself to groups that are being driven by players with perhaps different psychological buildups that put them in a position of... Uh, being either narcissistic or of being uh, sort of intuitively driving the story, which means and fundamentally they are themselves game masters who are now using the framework of the sandbox monitor to drive the story they want to tell. Now, ultimately, role play games are about the stories, and so a narrator game master either acts as a non-player character generator and simply responds as the different NPCs the players run into, trying to guide them but not necessarily direct them. Or he ends up being a window dressing monitor and just simply putting out things for the players to run into. And many of the negative stories about player groups uh, overrunning a game master or destroying the NPCs and such will fall from the sandbox monitor seat because he's feeling that he's doing the group a favor by getting out of their way and what he's really doing is put, putting them in danger of uh, fundamentally destroying themselves by running themselves into uh, story walls. The final kind of game master that evolves from this is a true storyteller and I liken this to a dance choreographer. Yes, certainly he has parts of the story that he wants to tell, but he's literally driving the players to make actions that will put them right where he wants them to be, on their marks, so to speak, on, on tempo, and then any engagements or encounters that he has planned play out in theatrical order. Now, they, there's an advantage and a disadvantage to a true storyteller. The advantage, of course, is that the dynamic narrative is going to fit with whatever theme the game masters come up with is going to feel uh, like a game session 
but ultimately it will come down to just knowing the numerics of the game well enough to put the players through their paces and there's never really a threat to the play the game uh, to the players so the final evolution of a game master beyond this these alternatives is to truly become a games master and that means he's a director he's a counselor as far as where the players might want to go and he's a lore master he knows what's going to happen wherever they go so that the player agency can be for forefront but the story behind it is still being driven and i have to say that i in being a game master you're going to find yourself in various stages of these it's not like i said a linear pathway that you must follow but this is generally the types of conditions you will go through as you are a game master as you develop your skills now this is i think an opportune moment to mention that i do have an academy a game mastery academy that you can uh take part in it's a two-year training program that uh, guides you through each of these steps and also gives you ways to shortcut the negative aspects of each so if you want to know more about that uh direct message me uh or post in either the chat box here or in my comment section on youtube which will be uh, uh, outlined at the end of this video so Thank you for that let's move on to the next section main po main point is just get out there and play the game at nikosrpg.com all right okay i gotta figure which camera to look at there we go i got the right one there we go so have having gone over the game's master's evolution i want to talk a little bit about game theming uh when when people when i was younger people would say what's the theme of your game and i was hard pressed to give them an answer because there are so many alternate possibilities of themes and as a storyteller who takes his group far afield week over week i really had a hard time answering this but i realized that we need to talk more about the possible themes the different ways that you as a game master can take your players through your story and these maybe are full descriptions of your stories maybe these are only referring to facets of your stories but you'll have a start to understand kind of what i mean when it comes to themes as we go along all right so we're going to start off right at the beginning Fa fairy tales and twists most of us uh, are familiar with the various fairy tales that are out there and the different missions that a group could go on to accomplish the conclusion of that fairy tale whether it is to find the princess who wears a certain shoe to deciding which uh which tree in the forest uh, is the host of the mystical creature or whatever the the idea of the fairy tale and the twist is that maybe you're telling the exact story that you read from grimm's fairy tales maybe you're talking about the big bad wolf or whatever or perhaps you've twisted the story and the big bad wolf is actually representative of a culture that's being overshadowed and given the players a chance to rectify the narrative fairy tales nonetheless are one aspect or one way of telling stories and if you get stuck on any one of these themes for an overlong period of time you begin to sort of brand yourself as that kind of a storyteller and this is just like being an actor you can become very good at character acting but once you become typecast into a character role it's difficult to break out of that and, and play something else so just realize these are all ways you can run games that you can mix it up and and kind of keep your players off balance in terms of what kind of a story you're telling my recommendation is stay within one of them until such time as the players become aware of it and then switch up so that you've got a wide array of potentials you could go to and also scratch the itch that you have at the time if you are for example onto continuities and imbalances Let, let's say you wanted to wanted to look at a story from the standpoint of it's pre-world war one and you want there to be uh, peace instead of the war that would be an aberrance because historically war did result so telling the story the narrative that follows a different course 
does require you to have a fairly decent amount of knowledge about what caused the effect that you're trying to counter so that you can uh, build into it. And this also leaves the opportunity for, to perhaps pursue a story. Perhaps you want to watch the beginning of World War I and you want to experience the players as they play out the roles of the var variety of nobles and leaders and stuff that made decisions. That's you know what you're looking for. In both cases, generally the story will play out until the, con uh, the uh, continuity is complete or the continuity is completely broken in which case your story can end and therefore you can move on to another theme just realize that each one of these themes will you'll want to use your play style to encapsulate for a period of weeks before you move to another one one of the most common in in, in role play games in general today is the continuity the uh, character based one and this is where the players have provided background information, backstory elements, and the players want to perceive of their advancement down those storylines. And a character arc bound story is perfectly fine as long as you do remember that the other players at the table will want to have some agency. You may end up required, being required to run multiple character arcs, either concurrently or sequentially. But the idea is that a character-driven arc is somewhat limiting from the standpoint of what you and the play as a game master wished to d advance. And again, there's nothing wrong with the making the choice of doing a character arc campaign. But in doing so, you're providing the players with more agency and therefore restricting what you can or can't accomplish for your own story elements if you have them. Another very common way of doing adventuring is the concept of the serial adventure. This would be along the lines of the pulp classic films uh, in Dungeons and Dragons environments nowadays. There are dungeon crawl classics that are literally built on this. The idea of you tell a story, you use, use up a module, then you take the same group of players, put them to the beginning of the next module and process through that. And again, this is a model and it's very comfortable and it allows for character advancement and there are a lot of pluses a lot of reasons to utilize a serial process but many times a a game master will be conduced or induced into using the term campaign for a series of adventures like this and by definition it's really not a campaign as i'll go into in a minute but the idea here is that the serialized adventures are a very popular way to go because you can simply you know, plug and play, put in your new characters and advance the stories session over session. That's one. Uh, that's a theme that is very popular. It doesn't take a lot of work on the Game Master's part because he's going to be just running off of whichever material or module he's writing, reading off of. The next are Monster Hunts. And these are a bit of fun and can be in individual camp in individual encounters or they could be a several night story arc as you're pursuing the monster or hunting down its lair or whatever and monster hunts especially in the modern era where we are used to the video game environment where you do set up a big bad and then you pursue the big bad until his destruction the monster hunt is a perfect course to follow for that of course, a player who is used to the concept of role play might find it tedious to constantly be in hunting mode, but these things are why you, as a game master, want to consider alternatives as well. Uh, the next would be a classic campaign of war. And this would be a game master or storyteller who is endeavoring to tell a particular segment of time in his world progression where there was some major uh, international conflict or interregional conflict. And these war stories, they can be serialized as well. So perhaps they run contemporaneously where you've got different portions of the battle being played out with different groups, or they can be played out consecutively. It's uh, you know the idea of a band of brothers type of storyline or a Saving Private Ryan type of storyline where you are 
progressing linearly through the battlefield and the different engagements and allowing the players to bring their unique flavor to that encounter in giving perhaps reasons and justifications for the alterations that you have in mind. These are all played out in the a true. These are the only adventures fundamentally that can be considered a campaign because they are defined by the very term the campaigns came from, and that was military war. Now, there are those who will run other adventure types and consider them to be a campaign. So it's a, it's now a, col a colloquial term uh, for game series. If they're run by the same game master, usually are considered to be a campaign. But the, the other campaigns that go on beyond this are now working outside of the pale of the original definition. So we are looking at uh, travelogues or pioneering ad adventures where the players are discovering new strange and new, uh, strange new worlds, uh, to, to use a quote from Roddenberry. The idea is that you're going to be visiting places you haven't been before, seeing strange vistas, introducing new characters, new creatures, new conflicts. And therefore, the players are the leading edge of information, which is kind of interesting because in, in threefold, number one is it causes the players to not be uh, on guard. They're not going to be able to know how to uh, meta play, for example, the engagement with a creature, or they may not have familiarity with the environment or the conditions that might be the in, implicit in the conflicts and this gives you as a game master a huge opportunity to, to introduce the players to new things many world builder game masters will utilize the travelogue process to move the players literally along the leading edge of the creation process so that the players are discovering it as quickly as the game master can create it Uh, alternatively, you could run an encounter or a process that is a villain counteraction. You've heard of a, a certain nemesis that is working on some major global project. This is the idea of the James Bond supervillain. The, the idea that some great superpower is about to visit something devastating to the planet or the environment or the region. And you, as the heroes of the adventure, are going to be you're going to be guiding your players into becoming these heroes and countering the actions of this villain. And again, these are all enjoyable independently, but as a game master progresses, if you do nothing but chase the same villain for a week after week after week, your player's frustration level will rise as well because it's not something that is always everybody's cup of tea. It might be your groups. I don't know, but I'm just giving that as an example. Um, the next would be pilgrimages or rediscovery. The idea that you've got an ancient world where there is lore that has never been uncovered and you're allowing the players to be the ones who discover and unlock those historic points in time. In the Indiana Jones adventures, uh, there are a lot of different ways you can do this. A lot of spacefaring adventures include this element of finding new, place, new places and new reverences new religions and all of this and so it's a great way to develop perhaps a more cultural approach to the adventuring but it again if it's constant fair you know, your players will become dis, uh, disenchanted with it so to speak now beyond this we have one that i want to mention that's really driven by the player base and has everything to do with the game mechanic that you're operating under if you're running adventures in the uh, Dungeons and Dragons or Pathfinder course or World, um, uh, uh, Warhammer, uh, World of Warcraft. If you're running in any of these environments, the players may be communicating outside of the game in a meta environment and building into changes they want to enact in their character from above the board. It's, it's as if instead of the advancing of the character in the story to discover things, they're doing it from the outside looking in and are therefore making the changes externally. I don't recommend this, but this is highly popular in these days. So, so if you're going to do this, you as a game master really have to become a rules lawyer and a aficionado of the game mechanics so that you can guide appropriately the direction these players will take the game. And it's in its own way sort of enjoyable 
if you are playing in a me versus you kind of a concept that you as the game master are a competitor with the players this is certainly a way to go another one that's very akin to this but generally has to do with the uh, originality or the, the newness the novelty of the players and that is the concept of the leroy jenkins or mutant spree type of campaign or adventure and this is where the players literally are ignoring the story the elements of decorum politics etc in the in the community of the game and instead they're just doing what they want to do come hell or high water so the idea here is that the leroy jenkins mutant spree element is okay for a week or two but generally even the most jaded players will be ready to get back to a more standardized campaign structure in a short period of time and after the players that were doing the mutant and and, and leroy jenkins things have met their ultimate demise Final one I want to mention is the most classic of them all. It's uh, the, the Lord of the Rings Tolkien approach. You go to find an item, then you go to destroy the item. Or you go find the item and you go to utilize the item. Either which way, the idea of a seek and destroy mission for a mechanical thing is a way to go. It will definitely give you a campaign feel as it will be sequential over a large number of weeks or whatever to accomplish but while this is also considered to be a classic adventure campaign this is not necessarily martial it can be as uh individualistic and as carefree as you want to make it but the idea is that the legacy of the group is actually associated with the accomplishment of a particular task which leads us back to the fairy tale because all fairy tales are is very much for shortened versions of the seek and destroy or other of these elements whether it be a monster hunt like beauty and the beast or whatever the idea is that the range of a game master will expand as he considers other role-playing themes than those of which he is most familiar and i again recommend the game master academy as a way to learn how to navigate the variety of styles of play and to bring to the players what they are ultimately looking for. Alrighty, so now we get down to something we talked about last session and the, we, and the session before that, and that is the concept of utilizing role-playing to change the course your actual life is on. And so we're going to be talking today about what kind of things you need to unlock your potential? What is it that you need to consider when looking at what skills that you wish to accept and attempt training on? Which ones you have perceived that you have uh, already got a skill in and you want to advance? And all of that. So if the first one that's required is a frank assessment of resources. What do you know? To what level do you know it? What sources can you cite? What mechanisms can you draw into use? Which computer programs are you familiar with? These are all things that are your resources. Some of them are more tangible than others. Perhaps you have a, a penchant for public speaking. Maybe you have what it takes to do broadcast and to elevate your message beyond the uh, living room so to speak this frank assessment is how you're going to determine the baseline numbers for the persona that you are wishing to advance toward in my case one of them is i wanted i wanted to become more of a public or visual presence and to do that i had to change my appearance hence the change of my haircut the change of my uh, beard to a much more trimmed version even the style of clothing has somewhat changed when my when, when there is an increase in my uh, revenue stream one of my agendas is to uh, to get a, an entire wardrobe that's more suitable to what i'm trying to do until such time i'm going to operate with what i've got to work with but the idea is to have a really frank discussion of what you have what your skill level is and what you're attending attempting to increase so that you can grant yourself the numeric rewards when they're justified and the ability to advance your persona towards your objective. 
This includes your arsenal of alternatives and tools. What is it you can draw upon? Do you have a, are you a quick, quick hire, quick study? Uh, can you, do you have a variety of skills? In my case, if you went through the panoply of the different occupations I've had, air traffic controller, microwave antenna, antenna installer, cellular technician, I owned a trucking company and a landscaping company and a moving company and, 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 and you can build out the list. Now, in certain cases, they are supportive. The skills that I have as a landscaper definitely would have helped me with the muscle structure required to be a mover, but they don't necessarily directly align. So it's a matter of understanding where your skill crossovers are and granting your skill modifiers accordingly. Once you've developed this list, then it becomes a matter of how you're going to advance the character through your story. Now, your story is obviously those things that happen with you in them or without you throughout the passage of time going forward. But you really need to also be able to dedicate your processes to, to develop the discipline to do the things that you need to to accomplish what you want. I've uh, just recently started back with the my, you know, fun, fundamentally a form of physical therapy is to get back into my roller skates. And I, I put them on the other day and I was shaky as a leaf, but I still could navigate and still could move. And so this is just a tiny step forward, but it does re-establish where my baseline level is because if you had asked me where I was without knowing and not having put the skates on in a while, I would have made an, an overestimation and then I'd have had to be embarrassed to bring that back down. So by recognizing when I put the skates on that I'm way back down on the skill level, now I can begin that prog progress to advancement again, recognizing what it's going to take. The next is to make sure that you are engaging in these actions in an actual operational environment. If all you're doing is practicing your practice, you'll only be good at practicing. So if you are not a public speaker, Find ways to become one, if that's what your goal is. Find places to speak, whether it be in a community study program, maybe in a school classroom environment. There's a, there's a ton of ways to start to progress down any skill path. If you wanted to be a carpenter, you got to swing a hammer, and you got to swing a hammer to build something. So... Start looking at how you can do that. The idea here is that you want to engage in actual operations because it will actually give you po uh, actual feedback on your, your uh, talent and skill level so that you can make the adjustments to approach the levels of competency you're looking for. The final thing in this portion is to realize that your actions in the field need to provide you with feedback. So you've got to be willing to accept frank and functional feedback from individuals that observe you, whether it be, I'm, I'm not to the point where my skate competency is back to where I would be willing to do so, but in short order, I will eventually be going back to a skating rink so that I can get feedback. I can look at the comparative values of what I know versus what others know, what my muscles have relearned and so on. And by having this feedback, I'm going to be able to therefore adjust and alter not only what I think I know about myself, but what real advances look like. When you do all of this, when you, when you, when you allow for all of this, you're providing yourself an opportunity to look at a capacity for course correction. Let's say I find I don't have the chops to be a, a dancer on skates anymore. Maybe I'll relegate myself to just simply being a casual skater again. Who knows? I might find I can get back up to the, the level of proficiency I once had, but I won't know until I try it. So by going through the process and engaging not only in the practice world, but in the functional world of roller skating, for example, then I can actually get the feedback to know what I might have and therefore course correct, maybe adjusting from a uh, competitive dancer back down to, uh, you know, general roller skater. And this all leads also to the idea there, or the, the fact that you need to be able to develop realization 
of recruitment renewal. As you practice and you esteem, like for example, in the case of my appearance, I've made changes to set a new baseline. I haven't determined whether or not I've gotten to that new baseline yet. I'm therefore experimenting a little. If you've noticed, I've done various things with the, the, the chin whiskers and stuff to decide what, what I want to do in that, in that avenue. But these will lead me to an idea of whether or not this transition was this transformation was where I wanted to go or whether I need to look at another uh, radical transformation protocol in the future. The main point is that the reason for doing all of this is to make the measurements of your movement me uh, measurable. You want to be able to determine if I've spoken publicly for, say, my 50th episode, am I a better public speaker than I was 50 episodes ago? Can I quantifiably see the difference? And can I track that so that I can make measurable, metered, acknowledged advancements so that character development on the, in the character sheet, the idea of keeping my new role in mind, I can continue to move towards that projection in a realistic way. And by doing these pieces, I bring the role of that which I want to be more in line with the person that I am to the point where they will once again align and I will be the person I want to be. The reality is, is that the world is a game and we are all merely players. And the only way to win is to actually play the game. So with having said that, we have reached the end of the materials I had for today. I could, Still, I'm running right about the same time frame, so I'm feeling pretty good about that. Uh, this has been Nikos RPG Nightly. Uh, this has uh, been Game Master J. I'm, not, well, I'm still Game Master J. Uh, Jonathan Albin, and I will see you next time. Here's the information you need to know about our resources. If you want to know where to gain access to Nikos RPG, you can go to nikosrpg.com, which has product info and merchandising. If you go to nikosrpg.info, you'll get um, information on the story lore, the current campaigns that are going on, and uh, much, much more. Of course, you can join our Discord and become part of the community by going to uh, right down here below on, on, the, on the Twitch page. You can get the access to our Discord information. And if you want to truly become a part of the community, check out our patreon.com slash Nikos site so that you can find out what it takes to become a citizen of Nikos and become a participant in our Nikos only games groups and get access to advanced information and such. Alrighty, that will conclude the show for now. Make sure if you like what you've seen, you follow us here on Twitch. If you haven't yet gone over to YouTube, we are at Nikos RPG and you can watch Tons and tons of videos, including our playthroughs and other uh, types of uh, videos. More of the Nikos Nightly News sequences and story lore as well. I've been, uh, this has been Jonathan Alvin, Game, Game Master J, and this is Nikos RPG. Have